Hello there. It's good to see you. Welcome to my Young Poets Workshop, How to Read, Analyze, and Write Poetry. My name is Rob Crisell. If you are here, that means you are a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grader. Um, many of you are seventh graders in Mrs. Christine Angeli's class at St. Jean de Lestinac School in Temecula, and others, I think, will be in one of the Murrieta schools. And maybe you're in fourth or fifth grade. Doesn't matter. This class is for everybody. Now, um, I am an actor. I'm a writer. I'm a teacher. I've been teaching poetry and Shakespeare in the area for about 10 years, but I've been writing poetry and writing fiction and nonfiction for my whole life. And so what I'm going to do today uh, and over the next six lessons is to try to teach you some tricks about how to, first of all, read a poem, because there's a trick to it, and then how to break it down, to analyze it kind of into its pieces, parts, figure out how the poet wrote her poem. And then finally, you're going to apply everything you learn and you're going to write poems. That is going to be what we're going to do over the next six classes. And it's not just going to be me. Your teachers are going to provi be providing all sorts of supplementary material. Maybe they'll provide you a lot of the poems that I'm going to be reading uh, during this time together. And we're going to have a lot of good times. Now, those of, there are some of you probably who are a little skeptical who are thinking, yeah, Mr. Crisell, I don't, I don't think so because I'm not a big fan of poetry. All right. So I'm developing this because we're all stuck at home during this time of quarantine, which is a bummer because normally I like to do this class in person with everybody. It's much more exciting and uh, I can get a lot of audience participation and everybody has a good time. Well, you're still going to have a good time, but now you're stuck at home. So let me ask you by a show of hands, which of you at home loves poetry? Okay, raise your hand there in your own room, huh? Anybody love poetry? I do. Didn't always. But yes, I love poetry, and I know some of you do too. Okay, put your hands down. Now, who of you just, you know, poetry is about as exciting as any other boring subject in school. You don't hate it. You don't love it. It's kind of in the middle. It's kind of meh. Okay, so all of you for whom poetry is sort of meh, you can raise your hand. Hmm? Okay, put them down. That should be most of you, by the way. Now, <clears throat> there is a last category of people. Those who loathe poetry, who just do not like it. It makes them feel, I don't know, dumb, or maybe it makes them just feel bored. Whatever reason you don't like poetry, raise your hand. They're at home. Okay. Oh, gosh. There's a lot of you. That's okay. Because this is what's going to happen over the next six or so classes. Those of you who love poetry, good news. At the end of our time together, you're going to love it even more. Only now you're going to know how to analyze it, and probably write it a lot better than you did before. Those of you who eh, are kind of indifferent when it comes to poetry, you just don't care either way, excellent news. At the end of our time together, you are going to love poetry. And those of you who do not like poetry right now, who even kind of maybe hate it, uh-oh, guess what's going to happen? Yeah, that's right. You're going to love poetry at the end of our time together. Why? How do I know this? Well, I've been doing this now for several years, and I've been teaching Shakespeare for almost a decade, and I know from experience that's what's going to happen. Now, before we get going, let me give you a little background on me. I am, like I said, a teacher and a writer. I've written um, lots of different poems. In fact, I'll share some of the poems I've written for kids in this uh, course. I've written lots of poetry for adults. Most of it's not published. I've written... Um, a uh, novel called The Zoo of Impossible Animals, which sometimes I present in the local schools around here. Maybe some of you have read it. It's an adventure novel. You can find it on Amazon. I've also written um, a book called Shakespeare's Book of Wisdom, which is kind of a book of advice for mostly middle schoolers and high schoolers and college students um, using Shakespeare's words. And I've got a TED Talk called How Not to Hate Shakespeare. So I do a lot of acting and a lot of writing. But right now, it's all about poetry. But you'll see there's some things in common between acting and being a good reader of poetry. So, let's get started. Now, what is poetry? Ooh, that is a very good question. Poem, when it comes from its uh, root word, just means something that is made, a made thing. 
So it's not very instructive, right? It's a made thing. It's something you make. Thanks very much. But we need to come up with better definitions, and we're going to do that in this class throughout our time together. I think it might be helpful to start off with a poem, don't you? Yes. Now, the thing is, the reason why I know you're all going to like poetry is because, guess what? You already love poetry. You just love it when it's set to music and it's called a song. Think about it. You ever been listening to the radio or to one of the songs on your MP3 player or whatever the heck you listen to music on these days, and you hear a lyric and it, and it moves you in some way. It, it, it makes you think. It makes you feel something or you relate to it. Uh, it gives you a picture into the person singing it. You're like, wow, I did not know that depth of feeling came from that person. Or it makes you happy, it makes you laugh. Guess what just happened? You just experienced poetry. There is no difference between a well-written song and a well-written poem. No difference at all. So quite a few poems we're going to read in this class today and through over the next six sessions are going to be songs. And we're going to start off with this one right here. Now, see, now you can see it there on the screen. Throughout this time together, you don't have to look at this face the whole time. That would be sad for you. So I'm going to put various things up on the screen. Um, I'm going to be talking like a mile a minute, if you haven't noticed already. Uh, I will try to do as many jokes as possible um, because, you know, poetry is supposed to be fun. So you can laugh at the ones that you like and just, you know, nod politely or roll your eyes at the ones you do not. But that's how I roll, especially after a few cups of coffee. Okay, so... Here we got a poem right there. It's called A Red, Red Rose, and it's by a guy named Robert Burns, and he lived in the 1700s in Scotland. He's considered Scotland's national poet. I'm just going to read it. Just going to read it right now, but I'm not just going to read it, okay? The first lesson we're going to have here is how to read a poem. Who knows how to read a poem? Raise your hand. There. Eh? Okay. Yeah. Good. You all know how to read. Congratulations. You are literate people. But there's a huge difference between reading and reading. Okay, see where I'm going with this? Reading versus reading. Okay, reading a poem means more or less performing it. And to do that, as my people have learned my, my Shakespeare that I've taught them, you have to understand it. You have to understand if there's a character and kind of become the character in a way because not every poem is from the point of view of the poet himself or herself. Sometimes their writing is a different character and you have to understand the meaning and, and the feeling behind it. And then you have to be able to communicate it using all the gifts uh, of a great communicator. And so we're going to talk about that today, how to really read a poem, how to squeeze the juice out of a poem. We'll talk about that. So let me just start. Here we go. A Red Red Rose by Robert Burns Oh, my love is like a red red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. So fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I. And I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas go dry. Till all the seas go dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. And fare thee well, my only love, and fare thee well a while. And I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand mile. All right. So, hope you liked that. That was actually a song. Robert Burns wrote poems, but he's really best known for his lyrics that he wrote. And so now we don't really know any of those songs. At least we don't know the music of the songs. We just know the lyrics. So they've just, they're just poems to us. That's what I mean. Very little difference between a poem and a song. Now, how do we even know? Let's just talk about what is a poem. How do we even know that what I just did was a poem? Okay, there it is up on the board. Let's, uh, let's talk about it right now. Okay. I'm going to give you like 10 seconds. Think about it. Maybe you have a piece of paper in front of you. That might be nice. And a pencil or a pen. Scribble down why you think what I just read was a poem. I'll give you about 10 seconds. All right. Not too hard, right? This isn't exactly brain surgery. This isn't exactly uh, 
higher math. This is poetry. All right. So why is this a poem? Well, it looks like a poem, doesn't it? Poems are not just meant to be listened to or read quietly to yourself on page, but they're they're meant to be looked at, admired. They're they're made things. They they're pretty to look at very often. And this is pretty to look at, right? It's not like a, a paragraph in your science textbook, which is right there. See how the words all go to the side of the page? Each one, you got these big blocks. Who cares? You don't get anything about out of looking at that other than information. That's the goal of a science textbook writer, right? Just to convey information as clearly and possibly as dryly, boringly as possible. Well, poetry is not that way. So let's look at this poem. How do we know it's a poem? Well, there are those segments, those sections. Uh, if this were a science textbook, we'd call those paragraphs, right? But they have a special name for it in poetry. It's called stanzas. Stanza. Say it with me. It's a fun name. Stanza. It is an Italian word, and it means room, like a bedroom. And so you can think of a stanza as being a room in the house. The house is the poem. The stanzas are the room. And you go through your house by going from room to room to room. Stanza to stanza. You're exploring the house. Each stanza is a little different. So these stanzas happen to be four-line stanzas. You can, those are called quatrains, but it doesn't matter. And you can see that each one is about the same length. Each line is roughly the same length. None of them goes all the way to the edge of the page. They're roughly, roughly about the same length, which should tell you that there is a meter and a rhythm and that each line has approximately the same number of syllables. In this case, Oh, my love is like a red, red rose, nine beats. That's newly sprung in June, six beats. Oh, my love is like the melody, nine beats. That's sweetly played in tune. Six beats. You think that happened by accident? Of course not. Poet wanted to create a very tight rhythm and meter, and he did it right there. Very good job. Now, not every one of those lines is the same. At the next stanza, you've got eight, six, eight, six, and it goes on like that. But roughly, it creates this. That's how meter and rhythm is created, through, through syllables, through beats of the line with different stresses at different places. How else do we know it's a poem? This should be really obvious to you, I bet, right away. It rhymes, right? Do all poems rhyme? No, they do not. And we're going to be doing a lot of rhyming poems, but also a lot of poems that don't rhyme. But this one has a nice little rhyme, right? It's Rose, June, Melody, Tune, Lass, which means girl. Bonnie Lass means pretty girl. Lass, I, Dear, Dry. So every second and fourth line of each stanza rhymes. How else do we know it's a poem? Well, every line is capitalized. Poets like to do that, right? Do you notice that? So even when it's not the end of a paragraph, like in that first stanza after melody, there's no paragraph, and yet that's, the next line, that's sweetly played in tune. Well, it's capitalized. Capitalized all the way down. That's usually a good clue that you're reading a poem. Again, you don't have to do that, but most poems do that. Um, let's see. Oh, and then, of course, it's got a title. And a name and I've had lots of kids tell me we know it's a poem because you told us it's a poem thank you very much for that yes that's true thank you wise guys but what are some other reasons well there are some expressive language remember poetry is not boring old prose which means ordinary writing it is jam-packed with juice with expressive colorful language that's raised to the highest power. Some people have described poetry as the best words in the best order. And certainly this is one of the most famous poems ever written right here. And, you know, there's some expressive language. So let's look at the first stanza. Anything jump out at you? I see something right away. Um, right away, he's comparing his love to a red, red rose. And he's using the word like. My love is like a red, red rose. Now, you probably know that by now. That is called a simile. And you're creating this image of your love as a red, red rose. How is a woman, how is anybody like a red, red rose? Uh, I don't know. They're pretty. Or they smell nice. I don't know. But it's a very expressive way of describing it. And then in the next little two lines, my love is like a melody. So it's like a song. Your love is like a song that's sweetly played in tune. Now, that's even more abstract, but I guess your love could be like a song because it makes you feel good. Pretty songs make you feel good. 
And then we go to the next one. And I love this part. I will love you until the seas go dry. You probably caught that, right? He's going to love his love until the seas are dry. Now, did that happen? No, he died. He died back in the 1700s, and the seas are still wet. All right? So what is he doing there? He is creating this beautiful image, and he's using something called hyperbole, sort of exaggeration for effect. It's a poet technique, poetic technique, and you're going to see it again and again, and it's something you can use later on. So he's going to love her till the seas go dry, but he's not done. And then he repeats the seas go dry in the next, the first line of the next stanza. Repetition, another very popular poetic technique. There's a lot of repetition in this poem, right? Starting at the beginning, red, red rose. He could have just said red rose. Why did he say red, red rose? Well, because it emphasizes the redness of the rose and it helps you fit the, the beat. You know, that you needed nine beats there, so he had to add an extra red. So he's going to love her until the seas go dry and the rocks melt with the sun. That is another beautiful image. You can imagine all the rocks on earth melting with the sun. Did that happen? Nope, he died. And the rocks are still here. In fact, the rocks will not melt with the sun until whatever, the sun expands and destroys the earth in billions of years. But wow, what a cool image. Shows you how much he loved her. And then, and that's another, of course, um, kind of an image. And then we've got a, a, a big fat metaphor. Now a metaphor is like a simile. It's when you compare two different things but in this case, you don't use like or as. It's like more of a direct comparison. And so he's saying, I'll love thee while the sands of life shall run. The sands of life. That's hard to figure out. Think about an hourglass. You've seen those old-fashioned hourglasses that are shaped like uh, figure eights, and the sand runs through them, and it's, you tell time by that? Well, he's saying our life is like that hourglass. And when the sands run, that is our time. That is us seeping through the, the hourglass. So the sands of life, that's our life. The sand is time. And finally, fourth one, we have one great image at the end. I'm going to come back to you, though it were 10,000 miles. Now, this is before engines. This is before cars and trains and everything. So 10,000 miles might have well been 100,000 miles. He's probably not coming back, but he says, yes, I am going to come back. All right, so we've also got some other techniques. At the beginning, red, red rose. My love is like a red, red rose. That's alliteration, where you have the first letter kind of um, rhyming, as it were, with the next um, letter in the next word. So love and like and red and red and rose. Alliteration, we've got a bunch of other techniques that we'll talk about right now as well. So I just analyzed that poem, all right? Now, that is a poem. Now, there are two, there are many different types of poems. We're going to talk about all sorts of different types of poems. We're going to read all sorts of different types of poems in this class. But um, I just want to say right now that a poem that I just read, because I didn't just read it, right? I read it. A poem, think of it as a big, fat, juicy orange. Now, you're going to be reading a lot of poems yourself uh, in your class or uh, hopefully at home. And the best thing you can do is to read a poem out loud. It's hard to understand some poems, especially when you read them quietly to yourself. When you stand up and you read it out loud, and then you read it out loud again, that sense is going to seep into your head little by little. But reading out loud helps, and then you've got to squeeze the juice. Your poem is an orange. Think about that orange. You cut it in half. Big, juicy orange. Hold up that orange. Hold it up. Okay, good. I can see it. Now, the juice, it's dripping down your hand, right? It's, it's a very juicy poem because poems are packed with goodness and juice and sweetness and wonderful stuff. But now you've got to get it out of the orange. And to do that, you've got to really read it. You've got to express it. You've got to perform it. Now, a person who's bad at that will get up with his big juicy orange and he'll do something like this. He'll do the, you know, I'll make this up right now. Roses are red, violets are blue, school is boring, and so are you. Did I squeeze a lot of juice out of that poem? No. It wasn't a very juicy poem to begin with, but I didn't do a good job at all. But when you are able to do the things that great communicators do, like eye contact, talking clearly, 
altering your voice, understanding everything you read, um, acting with expression and um, uh, projecting your voice. What else? What other good techniques do communicators do? Well, how about not mumbling, being articulate, um, becoming a character? Sometimes there are, there's more than one character in a poem. Well, you've got to maybe find a slightly different voice. We'll, do, we'll talk about that as well. So it's not very difficult to do. Now, there are two different types of poems right now that I'd like to talk about. And I think most poems in the whole world fall into these two categories. We have pretty flower poems and iceberg poems. Let me explain. Now, a pretty flower poem is like the one I just read, which happens to be about a pretty flower. Or is it really about a pretty flower? It's really about a love or woman being compared to a pretty flower. But what I mean by a pretty flower poem is it's not very profound. It is beautiful. It might make you feel good. You see that flower on the street or whatever in your garden, you're like, oh, that's a beautiful flower. But you don't feel like there's much more to it. I mean, there's a root system, I guess, and some complex science stuff. But basically, it's just a flower. What you see is what you get. That's kind of like the poem I just read, a red, red rose. There's no deeper meaning there. But does that mean it's an inferior poem or a bad poem? No. Some of the best poems, best songs in the whole world are pretty flower poems. But then there's another kind of poem called an iceberg poem. Now, an iceberg, if you know anything about icebergs, and most kids do, only about 20 or 30 percent of the iceberg is visible above the water. The majority of an iceberg is below the surface. That is kind of the case with lots and lots of poems. When you read it that first time, you think, ah, oh, okay, well, this is about a, I don't know, a tree. But then you read it again and again and you realize, oh, wow, there's a lot more to it. Let me give you an example of an iceberg poem. Now, I just read a poem that's about 200 years old, the Red Red Rose poem. I'm going to read a poem that's a little more recent, and it is another poem, ostensibly, you meaning um, it seems to be about a rose, and it's called The Rose That Grew From Concrete. Now, this is by uh, an author named Tupac Shakur. You might have heard of that person's name. Uh, he is very famous. He died at age 25, sadly, uh, in, in a violent gunfight. Uh, he wasn't shooting. He was getting shot at, sadly, in Las Vegas about 20 years ago. But he wrote a book of poems but he's best remembered for writing lots and lots of hip-hop albums. And he's considered one of the most influential hip-hop artists in the world. He made millions and millions of dollars. And this is a poem he wrote because he started out taking poetry classes in school, like you, and um, Shakespeare as well. He studied acting and ballet, and his parents were very interested in his education. He lived in New York and Baltimore and finally in San Francisco and then in L.A. But he wanted to write about his experience. He was a young black man. He was surrounded by a lot of poverty. A lot of friends of his had much worse educations and much worse situations at home than he did. And he wanted to speak for them. And he wrote this poem. And I'm just going to read the poem and then we're going to analyze it. All right. So there it is. The Rose That Grew From Concrete by Tupac Shakur. Did you hear about the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete? Proving nature's law is wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny, it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else ever cared. All right, so that is a classic iceberg poem. What, with an iceberg poem, you first have to figure out what is this poem literally about? What is the tip of the iceberg? What can you see above the surface? Well, this poem is about, look at it just for five seconds, what, do you think, what is it literally about? Mm -hmm. It is about a rose that grows up through a crack in the concrete, right? We've all seen weeds and flowers that will grow through a crack in the concrete. Is it easy for them to grow? No. They get trampled, they get uh, not much water, they get stepped on, pesticide, whatever. But this rose has done it. And then the rose grows feet. Okay, now all of a sudden we know we're in poetry country, right? How does a rose grow feet? Hmm, well it doesn't, but this one is. And then it has dreams. And then it learns to breathe fresh air and it walks around. 
And then at the end, he says, long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else ever cared. All right. So now you know a little bit about Tupac. So you probably are already figuring out what this poem is really about. It's not about a rose, is it? It's about a person who overcomes obstacles when no one cares about him or her, no one thinks they're going to amount to anything, uh, they're going to be on drugs, or they're going to get in a gang, or whatever, and yet they triumph over all, against all those odds, and they, um, they accomplish something great. That is what this poem is really about. Now, is it a poem? Is it as pretty as a red, red rose, do you think? There's red, red rose. Compare them. Well, they're both poems. One is prettier than the other. I think the red, red rose has got those nice little stanzas, and all the lines are exactly the same. This poem is a little bit different. It's a little bit more, mm, what do I want to say? Uh, it, a little more out of the box, a little more eccentric. It, it doesn't follow the rules. The first line has nine beats, the second line has seven beats, then there's eight beats, and then there's eight beats and ten beats and six beats. So the meter is all different. The, the line length is different. Does it rhyme? It does. Grew concrete. It feet. So feet and concrete. We've got an internal rhyme in the fifth line. Funny it seems, but by keeping its dreams. Then we've got air and cared. All right, air and cared. Do those rhyme? Kind of. Not exactly, though. That's called sometimes a cheat rhyme or a slant rhyme. And you see it all the time in, in songs where the it rhymes, but not totally because you're using something called assonance. Yes, yeah, an exciting word. But assonance is a valuable tool for poets, and it means the rhyming vowel sound. So what is the rhyming vowel sound between air and cared? Well, it's that eh, eh sound. And we've also got some consonants in there, which is kind of a rhyming consonant sound. And what's the rhyming consonant sound in there? The R. 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 Cared. Aired. So it kind of rhymes and it kind of doesn't. What else? We've got alliteration. Crack in the concrete. And then we've got an image. How is the central image created? Well, it's created using a very special and uh, exciting technique that you guys are probably going to uh, use in your poems called personification. And we're going to study and know all these right now, but I just want to mention them right now. Personification, that's when you give human characteristics to inanimate objects. In this case, a rose is given, you know, the ability to breathe air and uh, walk on its feet and have dreams. So personification creates this central image. And in the end, it's all about the passion of the artist. That's what we get from this poem is the, the central idea is it's a little bit of an insight into himself. But is it his poem anymore? No, it's our poem. He's given it to us. He's dead, died tragically at 25, and now it's our poem. And we bring it to life when we read it. So there's a lot of personal expression in poems, and especially in iceberg poems. So when you end up writing your own poem, you might decide, I just want to make a poem that makes people laugh. Uh, or I want one that just has a great beat. But a lot of you are going to say, I want a poem that expresses something that I have stuck in my mind and I've stuck in my heart and I want to get it out somehow. And it might not rhyme, might not sound pretty, who knows? But it is going to have some sort of bit of your soul that you're going to put onto that piece of paper. All right? Good. Now, let's back up a little bit and talk about what a poem is. So here's a little worksheet there. Uh, I'll just go through this quickly. What is a poem? It's almost easier to say what a poem is not, but we'll talk about what a poem is. It can be about anything. It has a title, usually, but not always. Sometimes it's an untitled poem, but this usually has a title. It's usually short, although there are plenty of poems that are quite long. Uh, the Divine Comedy, that's three books written by Dante, uh, a guy named uh, Dante Alighieri back in the uh, 1300s in Italy, he wrote three gigantic books, and it's all one big poem. And uh, John Milton and plenty of other poems can be very long, but most poems are very short. We're talking about a big juicy orange. We're not talking about, you know, a whole truck full of oranges. 
That would be a novel. Poems use very few words. In other words, they're trying to strip uh, language down to its bare essentials and say exactly what you want to say in as few words as possible. The economy of language, they call that. So, few words. It usually rhymes. Well, I shouldn't say it usually rhymes. Children's poems, they almost always rhyme. Ask yourself right now, or I'll ask you, do you like rhyming poetry, or do you like poems that don't rhyme? Now, most of you probably like rhyming poems. I kind of like poems that rhyme, too. Uh, most poems written for adults these days, they, it doesn't rhyme anymore. Since the you know 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, poems tend to not rhyme anymore. The poets don't like to be locked into having to rhyme. But for the hundreds and hundreds of years before that, poems were always rhyming. And still today, most people prefer rhyming poems. Most of our songs on the radio, they rhyme, right? It has a unique form and shape. Think of the red, red rose. Think of a crack in the concrete. One has one stanza, one has four very neat stanzas. Obviously Burns, Robert Burns, the guy who wrote Red, Red Rose, he had a very particular idea of where the line break should be, how many lines he wanted to have in each stanza, where the rhyme should be, and how many beats in each line. And so he had a very particular idea of what he wanted his poem to, to look like, the shape of the poem. Um, probably not the case with many, many poems, or many, uh, many poets don't have that, and probably Tupac Shakur, he didn't care as much about what that poem looked like. He just wanted to create that image. A poem often ends with a punchline or a twist or a revelation of some kind. You know, you'll create an image and then you'll come to a conclusion. We see that in A crack in, uh, Rose in the Concrete. It, it sort of comes to the end and you see this rose rise up from the concrete and he concludes with Long Live the Rose. So it sort of has this punchline, but you'll see a lot of children's poems, a lot of poems I write, a lot of Shel Silverstein poems, they end with some funny twist at the end. It can be serious, humorous. We're going to talk about this in our next class. I'm going to go through all the different things that poets can, poems can do. And it often expresses important personal feelings, like cracking a concrete, but not so much a red, red rose. All right. So I think we've exhausted that. Um, we've talked about how to squeeze the juice out of poetry. Now, I want to, right now, read another poem. And I've told you that not all poems, or you should know this, I guess, by now, not all poems are easy to understand. Sometimes poets like to make you sweat. All right? Why is that? Well, they're expressing oftentimes deep personal feelings. And some people have said that a poem is a way of expressing the inexpressible. All right? They're, they're trying to get something that's stuck in their mind onto a piece of paper. And sometimes that's not so easy. And that's why you have to read a poem carefully. You have to understand it. You have to read it out loud. Sometimes you have to struggle with it. And the work is worthwhile. Think of that crazy song on the radio that you've heard one time. And you're like, I like that song. That lyric is cool. But I don't understand it. The more you listen to it, the more you come up with a meaning. And sometimes it can be a very ambiguous meaning. Now, I want to read another poem. This is a tricky poem. Now, in general, you guys, throughout this class, or these six classes, I'm not going to be reading dumb poems to you. I'm not going to be reading little kid poems, even for you fourth and fifth graders. I'm going to be reading some of the greatest poems ever written by anyone of all time. And most of the poems poets, rather, will be dead, <laughs> all right? They'll be dead. I'm just putting it out there. That's okay, though, because a dead poet is good because the only reason we know him today is because he or she wrote such an amazing poet poem that it lasted beyond their death. And now we don't have to worry about what they think about, I don't know, our favorite political party or religion. They are just there as almost friends in the past to help us deal with something today. So. One of my favorite friends, favorite poet friends, is this guy right here, John Keats. And he wrote a poem that was not published during his lifetime. Like Tupac Shakur, poor John Keats, he died at age 25, just like Tupac. He died, John Keats did, of tuberculosis with a friend in Italy, uh, by himself, more or less, away from his family, never got married, 
His family objected to the woman that he loved, and he was misunderstood a lot of his life, but he did create some of the most amazing poetry that's still around and still studied and loved today. He died in 1821, so 200 years ago. And this poem right here that I'm going to read, well, it's an iceberg poem in a big way. I'm going to read it once, and then I might read it again. Okay, here it goes. This Living Hand by John Keats. This living hand, now warm and capable of earnest grasping, would, if it were cold and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights, that thou would wish thine own heart dry of blood, so in my veins red life might stream again, and thou be conscience calmed. See, here it is. I hold it towards you. All right, not an easy poem. Right? We're going to go through it quickly. Again, it's a little. It looks a little like Tupac Shakur's poem, kind of just a, a, a fragment. It's part of a poem, probably. We don't know. They found this in his belongings afterward, and they don't exactly know what it means. But this is what it. I think it means. The living hand. Okay. Think of a poet, a dead poet, as reaching out a hand to you. He's got his outstretched hand. Now, what is his outstretched hand? Well, that's his poem. And he's reaching out from the past, from the grave. All right? Now, what does it mean for you to grasp that hand? This is a metaphor we're talking about. This is an image. He's created this image. What does it mean for you to grasp his hand? Well, I just grasped his hand, didn't I? By reading his poem. You're going to be grasping the hands of a lot of poets in this course. And you're going to be bringing them to life. Notice what he says in that second line and first line. This living hand, he's writing it when he's living, obviously. It's warm and capable, but he knows that he's about to die. And he knows that soon that hand will be cold and in the icy silence of the tomb. But his poem, he says, is going to haunt your days and chill thy dreaming nights. So, in a way, this poem is not his poetry is going to haunt you. Is that a happy little image? I guess not. But I don't think he literally means it's going to haunt you like a ghost. It's going to make you think and feel and you're going to bring him into life. And by doing that, you're going to let red life flow through him. That's a metaphor, right? Red life. What is red life? Blood. The blood, you'll almost wish that your blood was into his blood. Giving him a transfer, a blood donation. He's donating to you his hand. You're donating your blood because you're alive to him. This is the relationship between a poet and an author. And he holds your his hand out and you grab that hand. Isn't that cool? And then your conscience calmed. What does conscience calmed mean? I have no idea. But I think it probably means something like comforted, um, made happy. He, you're able to relate to somebody. He had an experience 200 years ago in his life of what it means to be human. and He's trying to help you 200 years later, from the grave, right? And he's holding it toward you. Now, it makes it look like this poem doesn't have a rhyme. It doesn't rhyme, does it? It does have a beat. This living hand, now warm and capable. It's called iambic pentameter. It's the same beat that Shakespeare liked to use. 10 beats per line with the stress on every other syllable. So it's 10 syllables per line. Doesn't rhyme. Is there an image created? Absolutely. Lots of blood images, and he's got the tomb, and then you've got the central image of the hand. But it's not a literal hand. It's a metaphorical hand. And notice at the very end, every other line has 10 beats in it. But that last line, I hold it towards you. Five beats, only half of the 10. Did he do that on purpose, you think? Yeah, he was a pro. Why did he do it? Think about it. You fill in the other half, right? You complete the poem. So that's what we're going to be doing here. Now, to conclude today's lesson, I would like you to pick, well, actually, I'm going to read one more poem. No, I'll save that for later. Remind me, 
on our next class, we're going to read Jabberwocky together, which is a nonsense poem. And it shows you how sometimes you can enjoy a poem. Uh, and in, in Jabberwocky's case, it is a, a pretty flower poem and not an iceberg poem. You can enjoy a poem even if you don't understand it. All right. So uh, we'll read that at the beginning of next class. But right now, I want you to think about what a poem is to you. You know enough now to be dangerous. You should be able to figure out your own definition. As I said, there is no one definition of a poem. So I'm going to put up on the screen various definitions of a poem. I want you, over the next minute, I want you to think about which one, which of the top 14 um, definitions I have there, which I took from a book by Edward Hirsch um, called How to Love Poetry, I think it's called. It's a wonderful book, but he has all sorts of different definitions in there. I want you to pick one of those definitions, and I want you to be able to explain it either to your teacher, to yourself, um, and I would love it if you want. You can email it to me. I love learning about this because ultimately a poem is personal, and a poem means something to you that it might not mean to another person. I always tell kids that poems are like pizzas. So some people like Pizza Hut. Some people like homemade pizza. Some people like, I don't know, uh, dominoes. Some people don't like any of those things. Poetry is a little like that too. Some poem that you might like might not be the poem that another person's lo person likes and vice versa. Does it mean that one poem is bad and another is good? Not necessarily. There's plenty of bad poetry out there. Think of, uh, I don't know, the terrible pizza that you might get in some school cafeterias. Everybody might agree, ooh, that's bad pizza. Well, there's certainly lots of bad poetry out there, but none of the poems we're going to be doing is bad. So you might not like a poem, or you might not like it at first, but the more you read it, the more you like it. And vice versa, you might like a poem right away and then say, eh, it's not as good as I thought. The meaning isn't quite as deep as I thought. So pick one of these right now, take a minute, and then I'm going to go through a couple that really mean a lot to me. So. I'm going to give you one minute. Pick one and why you picked it. And you can either discuss it with your teacher or just with yourself. And I'll, I'll be back in 30 seconds. So. All right, we've got it there. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to go through that. I'm going to read this as well, just in case some of you don't want to take the time to read it. That's okay. I usually read it in class. So let me just go read them quickly. A poem is a message in a bottle, a time bomb designed to explode on contact, a soul in action through words, the best words in the best order, Language compressed and raised to its highest power. A secret that can no longer be kept. A way of knowing. A distress signal sent from afar. An outstretched hand. The bloodiest of art forms. A speaking picture. A collision of two unlike things. An offering to the dead. An offering from the dead. An old friend. All right. So for me, the more, especially during this time of quarantine, I've been reading a lot of poetry, I've been writing a lot of poetry, um, and just, just doing a lot of art. And for me, po poems, I think, are like old friends. Some poems that I read when I was your age, even today, they provide me a lot of solace and comfort, and they still make me think. And I still, in a way, define myself by those poems. Uh, sometimes they're parts of scripture, too. There's a lot of poetry in Holy Scripture. And even today, I, I, I will hear a, a poem, and it means something different to me today than it did back then. So one of the definitions that I like is an old friend. It gives me comfort. That poem, that poet has been with me all this time, even though they may have been dead for 150, or in Shakespeare's case, 400 years. And then another one I really like 
is a soul in action through words. So whether it's Tupac Shakur or John Keats or Robert Burns or Rob Crisell writing a poem, you're not usually just writing about nothing. Sometimes you are. Sometimes you just want to be funny. But oftentimes you're putting a little bit of something that means so much to you, some deep feeling, some deeply held belief, and you're sharing that in very expressive, poetic language on a piece of paper. You're taking your words and, and you're taking a bit of your soul and you're putting it out there for people to see and to share and to appreciate. And so that even 200 years, we can look at John Keats' poem and read it and, and kind of get a sense of what kind of person he was. So a soul in action through words. So you get a bit of that soul and it comes to life just like that cold dead hand of John Keats was filled with blood. In a way your soul reanimates when you read that poem and his soul speaks directly to your soul. Anyway, these are all poetic, metaphorical, expressive ways of defining a poem. So I hope you found your one. It might change over the next six classes. All right, so I hope you've enjoyed this first class. In the next class, I'm going to be reading a lot of smaller poems. We're going to be analyzing them a little bit. Some will be funny, some will be sad, and they're all going to be designed to get us to think about what, uh, how to analyze a poem. So we learned how to read it. Now we're going to start learning how to analyze these poems. And in the third class, I'm going to give you poems to read and analyze yourself. And hopefully you can do that with your teachers as part of an assignment. So thank you for listening. I will see you next class. All right. Take care. Adios.